Okay, we are live, but we got to let it breathe, breathe just for a moment. Got to bring on Facebook, both of our Facebook clans. Get the fam damly under the roof here. We'll get this party started proper. And we are good. Welcome in, everybody, to the Huddle Up podcast presented, as always, by Mile High Huddle, powered by Blue Wire Pods. I'm your host, Chad Jensen, and with me is my fellow football priest and the deputy editor of MileHighHuddle.com, Zach Kelberman. Zach, as I mentioned before we went live, I've had a very busy day finish putting some of the finishing touches on my studio here. I missed a lot of the news wire. I know it's kind of a dead day, but there was one noteworthy piece of news. The Denver Broncos are bringing in a linebacker. You wrote the story. Fill everybody in on Shaquem Griffin. Uh, yeah, apparently this week the Broncos, as most people know, have their mandatory minicamp over the course of the next couple of days, and they're bringing in several uh, players for a tryout, according to Mike Kliss. And one of those players, arguably the most noteworthy player, is Shaquem, Sha- Shaquem Griffin. I'm going to call him Griffin, uh, former Seahawks linebacker. Obviously, most people know him because he has one hand, the result of an amputation when he was four. Special teams guy, 46 games of experience, but as you can see, not a lot of tackles. He has one career sack, which came last year, and he has one career start, which came in the 2018 opener against, you guessed it, Denver. And as we were talking about, Chad, it's no certainty they're going to sign him, but why even bother bringing him in? I mean, the only thing I can think of, they are loaded at both linebacker spots. And apparently he would play OLB, but even then you have four players ahead of him on the, on the depth chart. The only thing I can think of is that the Broncos are not high on the other bottom of the roster types, the Watsons, the, the Natrez, Patricks of the world. And I guess Griffin, from his name value and from his experience, would be an upgrade on them. But he wouldn't be an upgrade on Malik Reed or even Jonathan Cooper, for that matter. He's got a great story. I mean, when he was coming out with the – Um, I don't even know if I would call it a disability with how prolific his college career was, but it was a disability that he had to learn how to play with and excel without having a hand. I mean, it's a phenomenal story, and it was really cool in particular. His brother, a corner, got drafted to Seattle. Wasn't it, Zach, the year prior, I want to say? And to to have the Seahawks draft uh, his twin, or was it the same year? I want to say that his twin came out one year prior, but – I could be misremembering that. Either way, they both land in Seattle. Really cool human interest story. Phenomenal, phenomenal path. Very unique path to the NFL. But I honestly am struggling to wrap my brain around the utility of this particular – I mean, the Broncos haven't signed him yet. Going to come in, give it a shot, try out, et cetera. But, Zach, the only thing that jumps out to me as a possible motivating factor outside of special teams acumen – I mean – this is a team that could use all the special teams help it can get is maybe they still don't know Jonathan Cooper with the heart ablation procedure that he had, um, who was going to be basically competing for the number four edge rusher behind Malik Reed. You had Cooper. He's going to be vying with last year's uh, seventh round pick Derek Tuska and some of the other futures bubble guys. Maybe they're just not sure about Cooper's timetable. That's the only thing I can really figure yeah. on this because Shaquem, you know, look, great story, but how productive has he really been in the in the pros, especially as an OLB, as an edge guy? Negligible. I mean, he's made very little impact thus far. It, it has to be really one of three things here. Either, like you mentioned, they're not comfortable with Cooper's recovery. Uh, they want to upgrade on a Derek Tuska, let's say, or they want to just help out uh, more than they already have Tom McMahon on special teams. And if that's the case, this is one of the better players for that role. He wouldn't command a lot of money. He has NFL experience. He could start in a pinch, and I'd feel more comfortable with him starting than Nate Patrick starting. So, I mean, it could be worse, but you really don't need a player of his caliber right now. It's more like more of a luxury addition if the Broncos do end up signing him. Most definitely. I want to take a quick look here before we go further into our conversation at his game logs. I just want to see where he made an impact. Um, his sack came against the Jets last year in week 11. Not many snaps, dude. I mean, I'm looking over here at his percentage of defensive snaps early in the in the year. He was playing about some probably his average somewhere around 25% defensive snaps, which is a consistent role player. That means he was a consistent backup guy that would rotate in. 
I don't know if he got hurt necessarily. I haven't done any research. I've been off the reservation all day long. But then Zach, he goes three straight games with zero snaps, and then he comes back with 6% snaps, zero snaps. And then from there, it's negligible, and, and he does get the one sack against the Jets. But I don't know. We'll see. We'll see. But it's not exactly a uh, potential signing that you really are writing home about. Exactly. And the, and the reason for his uh, infrequency there is because he was going back and forth from the practice squad to the active roster uh, in Seattle last year, from what I read. So that's basically what he is. I mean, he's a practice squad slash fringe roster talent. If you have him on the roster, great. If not, you're not missing anything. And uh, if George Payton feels like he can help out the, def- uh, the defense and, and Tom McMahon, I guess so be it. Indeed. And this is, I mean, Special teams, obviously, you need a good coordinator. You need good specialists in terms of your punter, your kicker, and your long snapper. But from there, how good your coverage teams are and your return teams um, really depend on the quality of your roster depth. And let's face it, man, post-Super Bowl 50, the Broncos, this is one of the reasons why I've always had just a small reluctance to completely uh, castigate Tom McMahon 100% because the man's tools, he's been, you know, scraping the bottom of the barrel. The Broncos have not had good depth, especially at the positions that usually traditionally fill those gunner positions and the chasing down the punts and chasing down the kicks. But now that script kind of has flipped. The Broncos do have some pretty impressive depth at linebacker, off ball linebacker, um, the cornerbacks, they got some young guys that can chase. They got some young safeties that can chase. So it, at worst, maybe this is a guy, as you said, Zach, who, who are you going to feel more comfortable? Like if push comes to shove, Vaughn gets banged up, Chubb's a little banged up, you need Malik Reed to play starter snaps and one other guy to step on, who would you want it to be? Jonathan Cooper, a rookie that's kind of still getting his legs underneath him, Derek Tuska, completely untested in the league, or Shaquem, who's been in the league a long time, learned at the feet of one of the best defensive minds in the game, Pete Carroll. It's a no-brainer in that sense, but – Still, that's a big if. Yeah, I mean, just to put a bow on this, two other points, like the comment just mentioned that we pulled up. He does, he's a speedier linebacker, and the linebacker they just signed, in fact, uh, last week or the week before, Peter Columbayi, he ran a 4 or 5 as well. And so obviously, George Payton is looking for speed in the linebacking core. And I will say this I'll commend Payton. It's June 14th. They're entering minicamp. They're about to break for the summer. And he's looking and turning over rocks to upgrade the OLB 5 spot. I love the tenacity and I love the roster building methods that Payton has employed his first year in Denver. All right, guys, we, uh, we'll see what else is on your mind. We want your topics, your questions. I see a couple of super chats. We'll get to those. Not a whole heck of a lot in terms of news to uh, move the needle. Um, But that doesn't mean we stop doing what we do here at the Huddle Up podcast. And suddenly I've got – what the heck is my computer doing? Let me try and close this. There we go. Um, All right. Matters of business, then we'll dive into the chat. Guys, connect with us on Twitter, at Huddle Up Pod. Also the main account, at Mile High Huddle. My partner, Zach Kelberman, at Kelberman NFL, myself, at Chad N. Jensen, and our great producer who works very, very hard. You know him as Buona Beast on Twitter, at John K. M. H. H. Also, make sure you're following the podcast on Facebook. Easy to navigate on your browser. It's facebook.com slash milehighhuddlepod, or just open up the app on your phone, Facebook, search Huddle Up Podcast, like the page. It'll automatically uh, make it so that you're also following the page, and in so doing, you're automatically entered into our weekly giveaways, randomly selected. As long as you're liking and following the page, you could be in the running for a t-shirt or a mug or whatever we give away this particular week. Also, guys, check out our main Facebook page for Mile High Huddle. And at the very top, you'll see a big blue button, become a supporter. Click that. It's five bucks a month. You immediately get access to all of our premium video content, including Kelberman's Corner on Sundays, noon mountain time, the Trickle Zone on Saturdays, noon mountain time. I'm going to be unveiling a new show very, very soon. For those of you who are Bronco history nerds, all right, we're going to do some fun, nerdy stuff that I've never seen before, at least not in a sports uh, podcast. It's going to be a kind of uh, Broncos book club of sorts, but it's going to be fun. Trust on that. So you want access to that, become a supporter, and then check out the merch store, huddleuppod.com. Get your swag on, get a hat, get a t-shirt, a mug, whatever floats your boat. It all helps keep the lights on. It all supports what we're doing here at MHH. 
And if you're not in a position to do those things, gang, it's all good. We're seriously just stoked to have you with us. Check to make sure you're subscribed. And on that front real quick, Zach, I got to address this. We received a, quite a few messages, emails from listeners who enjoy the podcast as an on-demand through Apple Pods that were having problems listening to downloading the podcast the last few days. Reached out to our network, Blue Wire Pods. Turns out that as we switched our host uh, last week, we went back to Megaphone as the main host for Blue Wire Pods. There was a few little bugs that got lost in the shuffle. We weren't exactly apprised of it, Zach. And I think part of that was because it went into a weekend and we're one of these crazy publications that work all through the weekend. Most people don't work on the weekends, right? Uh, and so we weren't able to get it to the bottom of it until today, but that has been fixed by tomorrow morning. It should be no problem. When you pull up your Apple podcast feed, you should be easily able to find the huddle up podcast, building the Broncos, everything as it, as it is. So just check to make sure you're subscribed like this video gang. If you're on YouTube, if you're on Facebook, it is so crucial to helping us grow organically. And three is the litmus test. If you like what we're doing, or if at the very least you respect the effort, share this video, help us continue to grow and reach new like-minded Broncos fans just like you. All right, John, do we have, real quick to get things open, do you have Slide and Glide, his super chat? There he is. Zach, a newer name on super chat. Welcome. Welcome. Appreciate you, my friend. I'll let you take this one since I've been stammering here for a few minutes. Slide and Glide says, and connect with us on Twitter, my friend, so that we can shout you out after the show. Do you think Teddy Bridgewater could get the Ryan Tannehill effect in Denver? In other words, go from being kind of, you know, um, damaged goods, kind of busted out, washed out, to suddenly landing in the right place and becoming a legit threat at QB. Well, you have to first ask yourself, and thank you for, your, for the super sliding glide, but you have to ask yourself, why did Tannehill take off in Tennessee? What was holding it back in Miami that he got with the Titans? And it's not just his supporting cast, and most of you, including Chad, know where I'm going with this. It's the coaching. So let's say Teddy Bridgewater, we can use the term, uh, you know, washed out in Carolina last year. It's why they replaced him with Sam Darnold. I understand he lost McCaffrey, but he did have some good receivers, and he had Excellent coaching. Joe Brady is one of the, the youngest, brightest minds in the NFL. And Teddy Bridgewater, he washed out in Carolina with Joe Brady. He's coming to Denver now with Pat Shermer. So if you want to talk about Tannehill, he's missing that key component of coaching. I don't think Shermer, and this goes both ways, I don't think he's the coach to bring out the best in either Locke or Bridgewater. So I don't see a Tannehill effect in Denver for Teddy Bridgewater. I would hope for just uh, competency under center from Teddy. I would watch just average play, surface level play, take care of the football, don't turn it over, 200 yards, couple touchdowns, and wham, bam, thank you, ma'am. Let the running game and the defense do the rest. I don't see some ascension. I don't see some second coming in his career. I think this was a hold the fort move by Denver to get to next year at quarterback. And Teddy Bridgewater, he's a very short-term option. What he is in the NFL is what he's going to prove to be after Denver, not in Denver, which is, unlike Tannehill, a career backup, my yeah. opinion. He's got, a, he's got some traits that are, are very intriguing that have always – uh, been attractive when you talk about Teddy Bridgewater, the quarterback, especially his leadership. I think as far as his football brain, his football mind, I think he's very sharp. I just doubt it, some of his physical wherewithal in terms of really being that dynamic guy that can just, you know, maybe move the chains like an Alex Smith could, but you're not going to get that. You're not going to get anything even remotely approaching Star Wars numbers. Now look, similar to Drew, all right, Teddy has his games where he's thrown down, you know, he's gone over 300 yards. He's thrown multiple touchdowns. Like he has those games and they're in him, but they're so few and far between that they, I mean, they're, they're the exception, not the rule. So you can't bank on that. You can't project that. You can't lean on it in expectation. I think Teddy is a guy that can go on to, as we've said on this podcast many times, if he, the Broncos turn to him, I think he's a guy that can help you win games if, and this is a big if that we saw and learned by last year's experience in Carolina, you got a good defense. You've got a potent running attack. You've got a good offensive line. You've got good skill position support. If all those are in place, just like we saw during his Pro Bowl year in Minnesota in 2015, Teddy can move the needle, but just keep your expectations in check. All right. Um, here's one, Zach, from Max Power jumping in. 
poking the bear a little bit from across the pond. Thank you for the super chat, Max. He says, why does Zach not, why does Zach not use the same weak excuses he does for Locke for Teddy? He had new offense to learn, plus number one weapon, Christian McCaffrey, was also hurt. And then he's got one more here that he says, uh, also, Chad, you said that Teddy can't compete against Mahomes. Rewatch Panthers versus Chiefs last year and rethink that take. Again, look, I'll defend my my take here, Zach, and then serve it over to you. Look, there are the moments where he can flash. I just don't think in the same way that you would look at Aaron Rodgers as an example. All right, I know that we're talking about two different quarterbacks here, but Aaron Rodgers suddenly becomes a Bronco, Zach. You're not worried about the Chiefs matchups on the schedule anymore. You know, you're more looking forward to those in anticipation because you know your team can put its dent in the universe in those matchups. With Teddy and right now with Drew, with where Drew's out on his curve as well, that would be like a happy surprise, right? If you were able to go in and throw down and keep up, like it's just not something you can bank on. I don't. What was the question? I used the same excuses for Locke and not Teddy Bridgewater. Okay, he had a new offense to learn. Number one weapon went down. Okay, I guess so. And we've admitted that. We've been upfront with that. Every quarterback last year, every player dealt with the same playing field, which was hurt by the pandemic and hurt by a very, very unique season, offseason, preseason, what have you. So everyone had to deal with that. And that excuse does go both ways. But what, again, what Locke didn't have that Teddy Bridgewater did have was excellent coaching. And one didn't take advantage of that, and one was hampered by it. So you can talk about excuses or what are facts in your mind. It does go both ways. But all I'm saying is if you give Joe Brady Drew Locke, Drew Locke is a much better quarterback. Coaching matters a lot, and that's why you talk about Ryan Tannehill. There's a reason why he was a backup in Tennessee to Marcus Mariota. He was, he was flamed out of the NFL, of NFL relevancy, partly because of bad handling, bad management, bad coaching, bad development. The same thing would happen to Locke. The same thing is not going to happen to Teddy Bridgewater. Coaching makes all the difference here, guys. It's the only point I'm making. I mean, I, I just pulled up the numbers to see how he did against Kansas City, and he did do really well. Went over 300, a couple of TDs. Who won the game? No picks. Chiefs came out ahead last second, it looks like. 31-33 score. I don't know for sure on that, but they narrowly won the game. He was sacked twice. But here, wrap your brain around this, Max, and anyone who shares that particular you know, outlook. How do you explain that and then juxtapose it with the crap performance? All of his stats against the Broncos in Week 14 came in garbage time. The Broncos got out to a multi-score lead in that and then allowed Teddy in the second half to kind of come back playing prevent defense. How do you rationalize going toe-to-toe with a juggernaut like the Kansas City Chiefs in that particular game, and then a team like the Broncos running on fumes defensively? No Von Miller. Uh, That game did have Chubb. So you had Chubb, uh, Malik Reed as your edge rushers. You had dudes that had barely had time to even don a jersey playing corner. I mean, this was not a defense to necessarily put you know, the fear of God in any quarterback at that point in time, right? In the, in the, in the ebb and flow of that, of the season, how do you explain going from, I'll read these numbers for you guys. So against the chiefs, he goes 36 for 49, 310 yards, two touchdowns, zero picks, nice rating of 103 two against the Broncos. He ends up with 30 for 40 passing. All right. Garbage time, 283 yards, no touchdowns, no picks sacked four times. <laughs> rating was still pretty decent in that game for what it's worth, but how do you explain that? Sorry, I'm laughing at the comment. Teddy, in a Super Bowl, that's hilarious, and that is delusion. That is t- uh, LDS all the way there. And I was going to ask you, Chad, because you have the stats pulled up, can you show me one game last year where the Panthers won on the strength of Bridgewater's arm? I don't hate the guy. I'm not against him. If he ends up starting for Denver this year, fine. But he is what he is. And some of you hate Drew Locke so much that you're hyping up Teddy Bridgewater to a level he's never ascended to. It's all man-made. That's the problem with him. He is what he is. A great backup to have, but a journeyman. The very definition of one. Here, Let's just go through the numbers. We'll narrow it down real quick. Teddy's stats in the games that he won, all right? Looks like, wait, let me see. What did they do last year? How, they went 4-11. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. They got five wins listed here. That's kind of weird. Anyway, um, all right, against the Chargers, he went 22. They won this game. 
21 16. He went 22 of 28, 235 yards and a TD. See, to me, Zach, that right wow. there, that's your that's your like best case scenario ceiling from Teddy. That's like best case scenario ceiling, literally. You know, um, w- the next week, Zach beat the Cardinals 31 21, went 26 to 37 for 276, two touchdowns and a pick. The next week, another win, 27 for 36. 313, two TDs. So that's the one game on this entire um, schedule from last year where he put up prolific numbers, relatively speaking, and the and it resulted Zach in a win for the for the uh, t- uh, Panthers. I just meant like what's a, a game where he won, not McCaffrey won or the defense or anything else. And obviously, we don't have the time for that. But that's like you said, that's who he is. He's a he's a safe quarterback, even though he's not all that safe. Uh, He's not going to ever light up the scoreboard, light up the box score. He is who he is. But why don't you pull up, Chad, uh, Locke's stats in the second Chargers game when he came back against them. I mean, if you want to talk about doing enough for your team, I mean, there was a highlight package on Twitter recently. I tweeted about it of the Broncos' comeback against L.A. last year, and every single highlight but one, which was a Phillip Lindsay long touchdown run, R.I.P. Phillip Lindsay. It's all Drew Locke. It's all him doing it, making the throws down the field, and, of course, the game-winning touchdown to K.J. Hamler. All we're saying is Teddy Bridgewater certainly has a floor, and that floor is respectable, but how could you debate that Drew Locke has a higher ceiling? That's all we're saying. Yeah. All right. Uh, Let's move on for a minute. We can can circle back to this topic. It's fun. Um, But let's see what else we got. John from Sam Bam in the hizzy. Good to see you, Sam. Appreciate you. Get a Twitter account, my friend. Connect with us so we can keep the conversation going there. What's up, guys? Do you think KJ Hamler's long-term role could be more as the punt and kick returner? Thinking there might not be enough passing targets available to keep him as a main wide receiver with Court, Judy, and Fant. And throw in Patrick. I, I still think the guy that is going to out uh, outdo KJ's offensive snaps is Tim Patrick. I think your starting trio is... Sutton, Patrick on the edge, uh, on the boundary, Judy in the middle, Fant. And then you'll see KJ Hamler when he gets rotated in, he'll probably eat out of Patrick's bowl. Uh, but in those situations, you'll see Judy kick outside and, and Hamler come inside. So the point, though, Zach, about, hey, maybe that's where he carves his role long term as a punt and kick return. I'll tell you this before I serve it over. If that's his, you know, if that's his trajectory, He'll last exactly as long as his contract, his rookie contract. Those aren't guys that get that second deal usually, right? Those are guys that, you know, all right, cool. We see what you are. You know, we can find a lot of teams just think they can find a punt kick returner, you know, off the scrap heap each and every year. At least that's kind of been the Broncos ethos dating back to Elway taking over. Yeah, I mean, the Broncos have suffered through the likes of, you know, Isaiah McKenzie, and then you had Jordan Taylor, who was getting literally zero yards of return. It's not easy finding a punt returner, and I wanted Hamler. He's a second-round receiver. He should be able to wear more than one hat, so I want him to be the punt returner. Last year, I think they were angling toward that, and then he had that hamstring injury, and they, okay, we don't want to risk that anymore. Then this year, what happens? Hamstring injury. They don't want to risk that again, so Deontay Spencer is locked into his one role on this team, though I I would love for the Broncos to free up that roster spot, get rid of Spencer and have Hamler pull double duty. If Pat Shermer's not going to use them, might as well use them somewhere. And yeah, we're big fans of Zach Azani on this show. I mean, the work he did with Cortland Sutton early on, he is a boss. Um, couldn't quite get Deshaun Hamilton to really turn the corner the way we hoped. I mean, there were flashes, but Tim Patrick is another one of Azani's success stories. Uh, Jerry Judy, I think, will eventually be another one of his. KJ Hamler, we'll see. But the point here is, you know, there's only so many targets to go around. If this was a Peyton Manning offense, right, and you had Star Wars level, or even if Aaron Rodgers suddenly showed up here, you could really, like, think to yourself, hey, there's going to be enough to go around for KJ. But in a Drew entering year three world or even a Teddy world, yeah, it's going to be numbers that probably approach very similar to his rookie campaign if he stays healthy through the entire season, as I am Supreme brings up here. A quick question here, Zach, from George Newton. Good to see you, George. He says, so here's a question to the community. Would you have patience with a handicapped linebacker that misses a tackle here and there when you have no patience to develop a young QB? I don't know for what it's worth. I have done zero research on Shaquem Griffin, but I don't know if if that's a true um, premise that as a pro, he has more than the average guy's 
missed tackle metrics. I can look into it, but I don't know that that's true. This is like apples and tires, though. It's not even a comparable you know, example here. Uh, a quarterback is far and away the most important position, and you have to look at all of the facts involving that young quarterback and the situations and circumstances that dictate uh, his career so far. And you look at Locke, five games in 2019, last year was last year. It's only year three for him. But Shaquem, 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 whatever his name is, Griffin, uh, he is what he is. He's just a backup linebacker, special teams guy, his handicap notwithstanding. I don't care about that. But he's when you compare a backup linebacker to a potential franchise quarterback, it's not a conversation that you can, you know, debate with merit. Yeah, I know um, that that was a concern NFL teams had uh, when he was a prospect coming out, but I'll have to do some research on that to see. Uh, let's see, three, according to PFF, three solo tackles, one assist, one sack. Uh, let's see if he. How do you, I mean, is there a missed tackle stat? They have everything else pro football they do. focus. They do, and if I wasn't on air, let me see. Maybe it shows here. Uh, missed tackles. He's got one in his career. So, or, excuse me, excuse me. One last year. My bad. One missed tackle. On however many, uh, I already navigated away from it. But you know, not a lot of snaps, but one missed tackle. I mean, that's not that that's not bad at all. Um, all right, let's see here. We got Dale in the house. Good to see you, brother. Appreciate you, bona fide superstar, checking in. He says. My answer to Max's question, Teddy has 59 games. Locke has 17. Experience matters. Great point. Priests, how long until uh, Melvin Gordon loses running back one? That's a really good question. That's a really good question. He definitely not off to a good start. By not showing up to OTAs, he allowed Javante Williams, as we talked about yesterday, kind of get his foot in the door and shine early, not just to the onlookers, to us in the media, but like shine to his coaches and his new teammates. Like I could see it happening relatively soon, depending on the mindset Melvin Gordon actually has. And all we can go off of is his uh, behavior up to this point in the, in this 2021 year. And the, the takeaway is he didn't show up for work. I know it was voluntary, but if you're in any other year in the NFL universe, you show up for voluntary OTAs regardless of what, you know, whether they're truly considered to be voluntary or not, you show up. He didn't show up. Yeah, you know, it's funny, though. The Broncos today put out, like, several videos on Twitter of players, like, shooting hype videos and, like, you know, uh, posing with a football. Melvin Gordon was there. You know, he, he shows up for that, of course. Anything to put himself in the center spotlight. But what I thought was interesting, Ryan O'Halloran of the Denver Post recently – I wouldn't say predicted, but he kind of intimated that Javante could be the week one starter. I mean, this isn't so much a timeshare. This is a when, not if. Gordon gets the torch ripped from his hands, not passes it over to Pookie Williams. So I definitely, by midseason, I think you're going to see an RB1 shift. But even early on in the year, even after the preseason, you might see Gordon being the most, one of, if not the most, highest paid backups in the NFL, running back-wise. Here's an interesting question from Goofy. How's Mickey? How's Manny? Let us know. <laughs> Chances of trading Melvin if Javante shines in camp. Zach, the only fly in that ointment is his four and a half million dollar right. base salary. Guaranteed. But look, he's a guy that in the right situation, he's a thousand yard rusher. You know, if he gets right. to play and he doesn't get hurt, an NFL team can plausibly expect him to be a bell cow, depending on what you're looking for. So there are some teams out there, depending on how training camp shakes out for them, right? If their guys get banged up or hurt, that maybe would be interested, even at that higher dollar price for Melvin Gordon. Yeah, I don't hate Merlot. I just think he's way, way, way too uh, uh, overpaid, highly paid, whatever you want to say about him. But yeah, you can't risk not having a veteran mainstay behind your rookie running back. As high as the Broncos are on Pookie, and they are certainly, traded out in the second round for a running back. Melvin Gordon, they already paid him his $4.5 million base salary. It's guaranteed. Why not just you know get what you can out of him? He's not coming back next year. And like you mentioned, he could be a 1,000-yard guy, not too far removed from a Pro Bowl, and a good guy to have. Let's say, God forbid, Pookie gets injured, you still have Melvin Gordon. I would hate to think if Pookie got injured, you trade Melvin Gordon, you're left with Mike Boone and Royce Freeman. Suddenly that strong running game becomes a weakness on your team. Yeah, I mean, if you put Melvin on a team with a established, you know, prolific Q, I think he's a guy that could be very productive and and earn, you know, justify the salary he currently has, or at least come closer than he probably would ever in Denver. 
Uh, roughing the passer with an interesting topic here. He says, what's with this Drew Locke maturity issue myth? I don't get it. He rallied the Broncos to a 21-point comeback because of his halftime speech. You know, I don't remember the halftime speech trope. Do you? I don't remember that being a part of the tapestry here, but let's just take it on its face. The the, the maturity issues for Locke, I've, I have never really heard it from anyone that is a credible source. Not once. The only thing you could really go off of optics wise, Zach, is the rapping on the sideline, the buzz light year, the Please. dancing, the I mean, that's the only thing you could really go off. Aside from maybe, um, you could and you really have to be trying hard to to come to this conclusion. You know, the comment that we heard from I think it was Tim Patrick about last off or you know, when this offseason started, how much Drew was in the building, he was working hard. And I'm talking this was like late January, early Feb uh, February how he's 100% different the amount of time he's first in the building last to leave than he was last year. By implication, that implies that he wasn't as all in last year as he probably should have been. And you could maybe attribute that to maturity, although I'm sure a lot of it had to do as well with the uh, pandemic restrictions on and just the weirdness of that year, players coming and going. It wasn't as free-flowing as, as it would be in a normal traditional NFL calendar. I, I just I struggle to 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 grapple with the idea. Even if I was a lock, you know, critic, why would I call him immature? Why would I criticize him for dancing on the sideline amid a victory? Why would I criticize him for celebrating a touchdown? Every other player does that in the NFL, and the ones who don't, we're always pointing the finger and calling them curmudgeons. We're calling them, you know, sticks in the mud. So I think he has a lot of vigor. I think he's full of life. I think he loves football. But I will say this, the maturity issues and a lot of this criticism in that department has been exacerbated by the media. And that was exacerbated by that Michael Lombardi comment about the playbook, which we can't even verify. That was one person's report. And I don't trust Michael Lombardi as far as I can throw him. So I think... A lot of the LDS community ran with that one comment and chalked that up to maturity issues or emotional issues or mental issues, whatever you want to call it. But I have not seen any lick of immaturity from a player who loves football. You can criticize him for a lot of things. His love of the game and his passion for the game is not one of them. It's just, you know, Drew Locke's energy. I'm not talking about his production on the field. I'm not making any bold predictions, but just that enthusiasm and just raw enjoyment for the game. To me, it's very Brett Favre like. And so unfortunately at this stage in his career, you know, he doesn't have the production of a Brett Favre, right? But, you know, two years into his career, neither did Brett Favre. All right. If you want to go back in time. Uh, all right, let's grab this one from Naj. Good to see you, brother. Appreciate you. He says, Hey bros, as fans, I feel it's imperative. We support whoever the QB is. I'm optimistic and hopeful for luck. But what are your thoughts if he plays well early, then gets hurt, misses games? Does the team stay with uh, him? Probably not. Well, if he plays well early, and you got to define plays well, but let's just say, you know, Broncos are winning. He's putting up some numbers. It looks like the, he's finally turning a corner, and then he gets sacked from behind and he misses time. Teddy comes in, doesn't really do too hot, doesn't, isn't able to kind of match the trajectory Locke had been on before he got hurt. Locke gets healthy, they probably put him back in. But if that happens and the inverted is true and Teddy goes on to terror, starts playing well, they'll stick with the hot hand. Yeah, I'm with you on that. I, I, I happen to think also you can't really have it both ways. If he gets hurt, the Broncos aren't going to play well because what, what team plays well after losing their starting quarterback, even if you have someone like Teddy Bridgewater. But no, this is a big audition year for Locke. And I, we're, we're fans of his for sure, but we're calling it like it is. He has to stay healthy. He has to prove himself on a game-by-game -game basis or else he will be replaced as the Broncos quarterback. It'd be a matter of time, not a matter of if. Jeremy, one of our great supporters on Facebook, says, why do you have to hate Locke if you think Teddy might be a better option? For what it's worth, let me let me clearly make this. i got to delineate the facts here. We're not saying that if you think Teddy is the better option, that you're a Drew Locke hater. That's not at all what we're saying. When we talk about hate, you know, let him hate and the Drew Locke hate and Locke derangement syndrome, we're talking about the people that are actively – rooting against him both within and without uh the fan base all right there i know a lot of guys who i don't question where their head or their heart is at that honestly think the broncos would be bet in better hands if teddy wins this job 
I don't think that they are lock haters at all, per se. It's all a matter of, you know, it's like something uh, one of my mentors taught me, all right, in the art of human communication. It's not what you say so much. It's how you say things, right? Tonality is very, very key on any topic, all right, when, you're, when you talk about communicating with another human being. The vitriol that exists whenever, for some people, whenever Locke's name comes up, whenever Locke versus Teddy comes up as a topic, it's pretty apparent. You can see which are the real Locke haters versus like the, a Locke skeptic. Though, right. You know, it's two different things. Yeah, that's a really good way to put it. And I, I was going to say, you're not a, a Locke hater if you support Teddy. You're a Locke hater if you hate Drew Locke. And so much of that hate has been bubbling to the surface since last season. And I understand a lot of it. You know, the Broncos fan base is very frustrated. Quarterback has not been a position that's been kind to them the last five years. But literally every single thing he did was hyper-criticized and judged with the sharpest viewpoint. I mean, even when he did something good, it was always talked down. It was always marginalized. It was always downgraded. And when he did something bad, it was always inflated, amplified. That's the hate that we're talking about. You can support Teddy Bridgewater. Go and buy his jersey. Become a, you know, change your last name to Teddy Bridgewater or Bridgewater. It doesn't matter. <laughs> but but it's just if you go out of your way to hate on the Broncos starting quarterback, to root for his failure because you want your narrative to be the prevailing correct narrative, that's where the hate comes in. That's where the LDS comes in. Not because you support Teddy Bridgewater. It goes way beyond that. want to grab this one from D. Brown. He says, all I'm saying is, how high is Locke ceiling? An okay QB? I've said this before. Like, I think Drew Locke, his ceiling, if it can be, you know, if his coaches and the football fates can massage him to that ceiling, is somewhere between the best you ever saw from Matthew Stafford and Derek Carr. So take like the skill set and the and the measurables and the tools of of Matthew Stafford and put it kind of in what the body of work has been for Derek Carr, which, you know, right. when Derek Carr is on, man, he's on. I mean, think about it. last year, the, the Raiders swept the Broncos for the first time in a long time. Yeah. And even though he wasn't like huge numbers, Derek Carr, I mean, he was hard to sack, got rid of the ball quick, knew where to go, like efficient, move the ball, knew where, how to feed his weapons, like a smart guy. Now, Derek Carr has those moments that you're just scratching your chin going, what in the heck were you thinking, dude, where everything is good for like three quarters of a game. And then suddenly he goes into a weird shell and can't do anything right and gets caught in the headlights. Look, you know, uh, in the pocket. So Drew Locke to me is somewhere as far as a ceiling closer to like the best we've seen from Matthew Stafford and, you know, from like a rankings profile perspective, a Derek Carr. I'm going to hold firm to what I've been saying. And that's his pro bowl season, Derek Carr. I think that was 2016. And I, if, uh, if they can get the, I think they went 12 and four that year, the Raiders. And if they can get that production out of Drew Locke with this roster, again, with this defense and the schedule being what it is, I mean, that's an easy double digit win uh, campaign for the Broncos. So, yeah, I would say his ceiling is right there where you just uh, notched it, Chad. Stafford, a little below Stafford, but above Derek Carr. How obtainable, asked Ethan on YouTube. Is Locke ceiling, though? Thanks. Well, look, I don't think you have to really grasp too far, all right, as far as trying to divine how close Locke might be to his ceiling. Because, guys, again, it's not as if this guy in the conversation gets talked about as if he's Paxton Lynch and has shown you oh, nothing. As oh, a no, worse. Sorry, worse than Paxton Lynch. We have a oh, Jamarcus <laughs> Russell comparison to Drew Locke. Thank you, Cloud9, for setting the bar at a new low. And Cloud9, dude, I got nothing but love for you, but that's just ridiculous, dude. It's an absolutely ridiculous, redonkulous take. I mean, come on, dude. Come on. Um, that, that was so ridiculous. It made me lose my train of thought. <laughs> Sorry, on Drew Locke. Uh, oh, the flashes. All right. Paxton Lynch. Look, was rightly and roundly and justifiably, um, criticized and castigated by media and fans alike, because basically with the exception of that one, I think it was the Jaguars game where he came in. I'm trying to remember which game he relieved his first real playing time when he relieved an injured Trevor Simeon. No, it was the Tampa Bay game. It was Tampa Bay. And he looked really good. And you're going, all right, yeah, Broncos are on to something. First round pick comes in, does well. And then he starts the next week in, in uh, L.A. against the Chargers. Might have been San Diego at the time. I don't remember. But against the Chargers and just looks like deer in headlights. From that moment forward, 
nothing Paxton Lynch did on the field ever even came close to sniffing his draft pedigree. That's not what Drew Locke has done. Drew Locke, look, he had a he's had a few stretches last year where he was, you know, he showed some alarming signs of regression, but this dude has put up some volume, right? You think about the Texans game, you think about going four and one as a starter, as a rookie, you think about the comeback against the Chargers week eight last year. You think about his solid, steady performance against the Dolphins week 11, played really, really well <clears throat> down the stretch. And then you think about that other tent pole game from the second half of the season against Teddy and the Panthers. I mean, this dude has shown you what his ceiling can look like. So the question of how close is he, how attainable is it? I think it is attainable. I don't think it is outside the, the bounds of the reasonable, the plausible that he could get close to that ceiling in 2021. Guys, remember, this dude is only entering his third year in the league. He's got basically a modern NFL season's worth of starts under his belt. That's it. And people talk about him as if, you know, he's done absolutely nothing in the league. That's where for us, it's like, come on, guys, we're just trying to give you balance. Like, it's one thing to be a skeptic of Locke. Fine. Uh, totally cool. It's one thing to kind of lean toward Teddy. Cool. Or Aaron Rodgers or Deshaun Watson. Cool. But just don't act as if Drew Locke has shown you absolutely nothing in this league. It's so funny to me when you're talking, I'm thinking about Paxton Lynch and Locke receives as much criticism or more criticism for rapping on the sideline amid a victory than Paxton Lynch did while crying during a loss. And there's that's derangement to me in terms of his ceiling though. Listen, Listen, I mean, I saw a comment from Crazy K who's living up to uh, their name in the comment section. We're going to give Locke five or six years. No, Locke gets this year, this year only. It's it's put up or shut up time for Drew, not four, not five or six, this coming season. But his ceiling, everyone forgets. It's not just on him. The Broncos brought in a coordinator. They fired the guy that went four and one with Locke as a rookie to bring in Pat Shermer because he's a quarterback whisperer, because he's a quarterback guru. They brought in Mike Shula because he works well with the young quarterbacks. So where does the onus fall on them to get the most out of Drew Locke? I understand they're not on the field. They're not throwing the picks. They're not, you know, committing the turnovers, but they're the ones that are supposed to make him better. And they made him worse than what he was as a rookie. So in terms of his ceiling, yeah, it's on Drew to go out on the field and realize that potential, but it's on his coaching staff and his handlers to help him get to that point. That's what a coaching staff is for, right? Absolutely. And if there's anything that really makes me doubt my optimism for Drew's year three leap, it's like, hey, man, does Shermer and Shula really have a feel for what they've got in Drew Luck? And that's not to take the onus off Drew. Like, this is up to him. I mean – for better or for worse, whatever coaches you've got, like, look, dude, it's sink or swim, and the onus falls on your shoulders. you got to figure out how to find a way, make a way. But I'm always going to wonder whether he succeeds or fails, what could have happened if Rich Scangarello doesn't get fired, as an example. Uh, George Newton, what's up, dude? Good to see you. Uh, we've already got one of your questions. Thank you for the super chat. He says, people just don't understand developing a young quarterback. It doesn't just happen quickly in most cases. See, that's the other thing that works against Drew in this whole locked arrangement syndrome phenomenon. And that is that fans, I tell you what, like if you bring up the fact that, oh, well, you know, look at the obstacles of 2020 with the pandemic. What's the first word out of their mouth, Zach? The first name that comes out, Justin Herbert. Well, Justin Herbert. Right. Fresh out of the box, sets the league on fire, breaks all the rookie passing records. I mean, then how do you explain that? E that was an even playing field. Both guys were learning a new scheme. One lit up the league. The other one had an up and down season. But if you point to one outlier, and again, it's pretty obvious that Justin Herbert was an outlier. No one had ever produced a rookie season like that ever before at the quarterback position. I mean, there had been some record moments like Cam Newton set some records as a rookie uh, Alex, or uh, excuse me, uh, Andrew Luck, RG3. There have been some impressive Russell Wilson, uh, rookie bodies of work, Peyton Manning, but no one until Justin Herbert really put it all together. That tells you it's an outlier. So to compare a situation like Drew Locke is in and what he weathered last year to the unicorn, it's the inverted argument of the people that say you can't compare Drew Locke to John Elway's rook, uh, first two or three years, or Peyton Manning, or Brett Favre, or anyone else. We're talking about Hall of Famers here. These are outliers. You can't compare him. It's the same thing. You can't compare him to what right. an outlier did 
in a, in a similar situation. So just keep that in perspective. Every situation is unique. I've been saying that. You can't compare one to the other. A lot of Broncos country wants to bring up Josh Allen as it means to either justify Drew Locke or criticize Drew Locke. But the thing with Herbert was, again, coaching. I'm, I'm pretty sure the Chargers, I don't know if he was the coordinator or the quarterback's coach, he is now the coordinator for Seattle. I don't see Shermer getting a coordinator, another coordinator job. I don't see Mike Shula being hired away. So he had the benefit of that. He had the benefit of having more experienced talent around him. I would say Keenan Allen, the receiving core. Who did Drew Locke have thrown to last year? He had a two rookie receivers and a tight end that was being that was banged up half the year or underutilized. So it, it's not apples to apples in any situation. All we can do is judge Locke by what he's done in Denver, what he did last year, and what we think he could do this year, given the opportunity. It takes a while to develop a quarterback. And that's why it was a great point earlier. I can't remember who brought it up. But when you compare a quarterback that has... 18 starts to a quarterback that has 59 career starts. I mean, how could you, how could you, how could you make the argument for one and ignore the argument for the other? Maybe Teddy Bridgewater got to this point if you're a Teddy Bridgewater fan because he had that experience, but you're not willing to give Locke the same experience. It makes no sense to me. Yeah, and that's another it's a great point. Is that Justin Herbert had Pep Hamilton as his position coach last year, um, and it worked wonders. I mean, Pep Hamilton parlayed that into a promotion with the Houston Texans as passing game coordinator and quarterbacks coach. So it's like just this side of being a coordinator, but still like a full offensive coordinator, this guy's bona fides. I mean, I remember him dating all the way back to uh, his time with the jets, the Niners, the bears, Stanford uh, as the offensive coordinator for um, Andrew Luck. All right. Now look, Pat Shermer, he's got some bona fides. You know, he was the AP assistant coach of the year after the 2017 season. Mike Shula, he was the brainchild behind that juggernaut Cam Newton offense in 2015 that got all the way to the Super Bowl before the Broncos buzzsaw hit him in the face. There is some coaching wherewithal there, which is what part of what made last year so head scratching because it wasn't just Drew. Dale, thank you for the super chat, bro. It wasn't just Drew, lack of um feel for what they had no fan lack of feel for how to really make the most of their playmakers and just like but in the same way that i'm not going to crucify drew because of the weird outlier off season that was 2020 didn't even get to be in the same room with his coaches until freaking august in that same way i'm reluctant to completely throw the baby out with the bathwater relative to the coaches because it goes both ways they didn't get a chance to really get a feel for their dudes till the 11th hour and so that's why we're hoping it takes a massive step forward, all of them, this year. And, yes, last thing, it does take time. Most quarterbacks, even the ones that come out of the box hot like Patrick Mahomes, they take time to fully develop. Drew, he's still in the oven. He's still percolating. He's still marinating. And it's either going to happen or it's not. I still am optimistic that it's going to happen. Yeah, and the guy I was thinking of uh, is Shane Steichen. Steichen. I mean, he was the coordinator for the Chargers last year. He's now the Eagles OC. You mentioned Pep Hamilton. They also had Joe Lombardi on staff. I mean, that's a pretty elite coaching staff for the Chargers. And when you compare that to what Locke had last year, again, after losing his two top receivers or, you know, working with two rookie receivers after losing Cortland Sutton, you compare those three coaches to Pat Shermer and Mike Shula. There's no comparison. So Justin Herbert had a great season, but I think he was benefited in way more ways than one than Locke was. Kane Dawson flipping the script a little bit here. Appreciate you, bro. Good to see you. He says, having a solid one-two punch in the running game would be a great elixir to help fix our quarterback blues no matter who's handing him the rock. Hashtag win the West. That's another thing to be really bullish on no matter who wins the job. You're going to have what is shaping up to be anyway, a really solid, dominant rushing attack. Melvin Gordon, Pookie, plus an offensive line that, you know, if right tackle ends up coming together, we'll see if it ends up being Bobby Massey or who ends up winning right tackle. But this is an offensive line, I mean, especially if Lloyd Cushenberry, even if he stays, you know, maintains his job as the starting center, you expect him to take some form of a step forward in year two with all the reps and, and the time on task he got last year. You expect to see Graham Glasgow stay healthy all year long, not have to catch the bug that he caught last year, which is another reason why he had a little dip there. Dalton Reisner, it's time for you to really storm onto the stage and, and really live up to your draft pedigree. Garrett Bowles is what he is, all pro left tackle. This is an offense that can field a rushing attack, quite potent regardless of who's under yep. center. So good point there, King. 
And that's going to be whatever quarterback it is, is their best friend, is, is an elite top-notch running game. And that's what I think Vic Fangio is setting up for this year. Old school, ground and pound, rely on the running game, rely on the defense, and hope the quarterback doesn't lose the game for them. And regardless of if, if you support Teddy or support Drew, having the combination of Gordon and Pookie, and also Mike Boone, Royce Freeman, I mean, this is a pretty lethal rushing attack, Chad. And you pair that, again, with the defense, and like you said, the OL and the, the weapons around them, I mean, it's going to be pretty fun to watch on the ground, at least in Denver this season. Dave from Georgia. It's good to see you, brother. Appreciate you. One of our bona fide Mount Rushmore superstars. He says, hey, priest. Hey, beast. So every player in the NFL celebrates. Why is it such a big deal for luck? Let them hate. Hashtag Browns country. I've said this before, Zach. It really comes down to, like, as a rookie, he got away with it for the most part because the results were there. He went four and one. But right. if you – do that on the field, on the sideline, and the results don't come. You just make yourself an easy target, and that's really all it comes down to. And that's why I think if you're his coaches, you don't want to necessarily tell him to mute his enthusiasm out there and his swag and his confidence, but just be careful with some of that stuff that can end up on Sports Center in the worst way because when things aren't going the greatest for you, it's going to be thrown in your face. You know, there's nowadays the NFL has re relaxed the rules to an extent where entire teams like defenses or offenses can take selfies in the end zone with a football. And that's OK. But Drew Locke can't go like this, like Buzz Lightyear, without drawing criticism. I saw a comment on the side that said, oh, well, Paxton Lynch, uh, he was crying because he was losing and, and I cried in Pee Wee. Can you imagine if pa if Drew Locke was the one crying on the sideline? It would be headline news all over Denver. So, again, I mean, he's judged from totally an unfair point of view, regardless of his own uh, admitted shortcomings. Maybe this has a little something to do with the, the true you know, backlash against Locke, what I Am Supreme says here. As one of Locke's biggest detractors, I must admit a big part of the reason I'm so critical is because I see the talent and it kills me that he has yet to put it together on the field. It bothers me, too, that we haven't seen the production perfectly match the tools and the potential this kid has. But a big part of that, again, I am supreme, is that he's a young quarterback going through his developmental learning curve. And right in the middle of that, he gets handed the pandemic year. So that's why we're just saying, hey, pump the brakes a little bit, pull back, let it come out in the wash. Don't crucify the kid. Let him get out there and battle. And if it's meant to be, it's meant to be. If it's not, we're going to be right here with you going, man, it's a shame Drew didn't work out because he sure had some talent. Sure seemed like he had some it factor about him, but the stars, they just didn't align. We're not there yet. And you know what? I give I am supreme credit here. At least if you're not a Locke fan, you're you're reasonable and you're logical as to why you're not. You're not just saying, oh, Locke sucks. He's Jamarcus Russell. You're telling us why you're, you're doubtful. You're telling us why you're skeptical. And I agree with you. I mean, last five years have been a crap show, especially a quarterback. And fans, now in Denver, Chad, unfortunately, the Rockies, the Avs, the Nuggets, it's Broncos time now. So the, the Broncos fans want to see some winning in Denver. I get that. But just let it play out a little more. If Locke's not the guy, he's not the guy. We'll know soon enough. And for what it's worth, um, during the 2019 pre-draft process, you know, I talked to a lot of people, being at the Combine, Zach and I um, – all the different contacts we have in the league. The biggest reason Drew Locke slipped out of the first round was because the NFL GM, scouts, coaches never felt like his production at Missouri matched the talent. And so it creates a big why. You know, what's going on there? Why was he unable to kind of reach his ceiling as a, as a collegiate? And he still hasn't reached it, right? But again, it's early in the process and things have to play out. Miller, 707, good to see you, buddy. Appreciate you being with us. He goes, at this point, we need to roll with Locke and find out 100% if he is or isn't the guy. I don't want to give up on him too early. We need to see him have a full season. If he's going to pop, it's this season. I, I'm with you, but in this particular situation, Miller, 707, Locke has to, is the guy that's going to determine that. He's got to go out there and beat Teddy Bridgewater. If he can't, it's just going to be a similar, not apples to apples, but a similar sad story as Paxton Lynch where, you know, hey, Paxton, didn't work out for you, but my dog, you couldn't beat out Teddy Bridge or uh, Trevor Simeon. So it's a similar thing here for Drew. He's got to vanquish Teddy and then all things are possible, but that's the first step in the, in the process.
Yeah, I agree with the premise here, though. It's like, regardless, just let him get that audition. Let him get that chance. And what he does with that chance, we'll judge him on that. But to prejudge him or to prematurely pull the plug, and then you're spending the, the rest of our football careers wondering, what if? What if we gave Locke more time? What if we didn't fire Skangarello? So if he's going to fail, at least let him fail on his own. Let, and then we know it wasn't the Broncos, it wasn't Shermer, it was Drew Locke. Ashton says, like Charlie said, do we sign Teddy to a contract if he plays well this season? So you got to define mm. plays well. You know, if it's like a Ryan, as was mentioned by a previous comment, if it's a Ryan Tannehill caliber, like comeback player of the year type of season minus the injury, you know, like Ryan Tannehill was a comeback type player, but he wasn't coming off an injury. He was coming off, you know, not meeting expectations as a former first round pick in his original city. Then he goes on to have success. And if it's that level of team success, yes. Like if the Broncos roll with Teddy and he's the quarterback for at least three quarters of the season and they make the playoffs, he probably gets a, another contract. Probably. But we'll see. The only way uh, the Broncos don't draft a quarterback next year or acquire a new quarterback is if Locke balls out. If Locke fails or gets hurt and Teddy takes over, if he plays well, I can see the Broncos signing him to a one-year, maybe two-year contract, but they're in the market next offseason for a franchise quarterback, probably through the draft. And, uh, Chad, we just put out a way too early. I wrote up a story that went on the Facebook page last night the Broncos projected to pick number 23rd overall in 2022, taking Georgia quarterback JT Daniels. I think that's where the stars are aligning if Locke doesn't ball out this year. Agreed. Uh, Chisus coming in with a super chat, a newer name. Welcome. Thank you. Appreciate the support. Uh, connect on Twitter. You guys rock, but your chat sucks. This is why I don't tune in often anymore. Yeah, it's, you know, I don't think it's our chat per se, Chisus. Jesus, Jesus, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> um, I think it's just the general um, temperature of Broncos country right now is very, it's just, you know, bickering. Yeah. A lot of stiff necks right now in Broncos country and, you know, backbiting and people just getting out of control with the, with the hot takes, mostly fueled by the situation of quarterback. And as a guy who grew up with John Elway posters on my wall and, a, you know, I'm a Broncos fan just like you guys at bottom. All right. I've, just as disappointed of the past five years post Super Bowl 50 as the next fan. I really am. But I, you know, I, I can keep it in perspective. I think, I mean, some of you, there, we, some of our detractors will argue that we are nothing but lock stands and, you know, we hate Teddy Bridgewater. We honestly try to be as balanced as we possibly can on these fronts. But when sometimes the blowback from, from the chat, as Jesus says here is so toxic and it's so, irrational we have to address it when we see it yeah and um you know i want to echo mark murphy he said that the aaron Rodgers whole dilemma is the thing that's dividing the packers fan base this is dividing the broncos fan base this lock versus teddy bridgewater competition or even just the lock where you stand on him if you support him or you don't support him it's just causing so much friction and tension in broncos country it will settle down we appreciate your support just give it some time and let us get to training camp and things should quiet down a little bit all right we got one or two more and then we got to dip on out we got uh uh geiger gaming we got bg and we got kiaka and we got to go. Good to see you. Make sure you connect with us on Twitter, my friend. This is another newer name. I think I remember seeing you at least one other time on Super Chat. But either way, welcome. welcome. Thank you. Hi, guys. Just showing some love and thank you. And isn't that down under, right? That's Australian, uh, I think. Confirm that. Uh, I have finally found a level-headed Broncos podcast when it comes to lock. Hashtag Broncos for life. I'm glad to hear that, dude. I really am. Because, you know, last week or so, a lot of – negativity from commenters and stuff saying like we're overboard blind drew lock stands and we really do strive to bring now sometimes we'll bring some salt all right we'll bring some sizzle we'll say things hot takes sometimes and how we say things remember going back to tonality sometimes the way we say say things might come off a little strong but at the end of the day neither one of us are saying that teddy bridgewater sucks neither one of us are saying drew locks the truth we're trying to keep things balanced. 
<laughs> it's so simple. I, the truth is right there in the middle, guys. We've been saying it for months now, literally months. We're straddling that fence. Locke is not a bust. He's not the franchise quarterback yet. Teddy Bridgewater is not the worst quarterback ever, but he's not the best quarterback ever. The truth is right there down the middle. And thank you for your support, uh, Geiger Gaming, I believe it was. Uh, but we were called, we were blamed yesterday, Chad. It was yesterday, the day before. We were the ones that were causing the division. We right. were the ones that were causing the dissension. So I'm happy that some people out there, even down under, think we have a le- level headed approach to the Broncos quarterback situation. All right, real quick, John, I'm grabbing BG. Appreciate you, bro. This is a Mount Rushmore superstar that has been with us a long time. BG, you know you mean a lot to us, buddy. So thanks for being here. Thanks for the super chat support. Helping keeping the lights on means a lot, bud. Um, also, I want to grab this one real quick, guys, from Kevin on Facebook, one of our great st- supporters and star senders on Facebook. He says, hey, guys, if Drew could average 24 points a game and the defense is as good or close as good uh, as 2015's defense, which ranked fourth, could we see a solid season, a solid of a season of Super Bowl 50? I don't see that as the – realistically on the table this year. I mean, you got to remember guys, as much as is made that Peyton Manning was, you know, the Broncos limp to the Super Bowl, dragging like a half dead Peyton Manning, Peyton Manning for whatever he lacked with some of his physical faculties starting to fail him. Zach, he brought that hall of fame brain and that wherewithal and the experience, the Broncos, even with that vicious tip of the spear defensively, don't even get to Super Bowl 50 if Brock Osweiler is the quarterback that year. So anyway, to the point of this being a, another Super Bowl caliber year, I don't see that. But I do see this as being a – if you can get to 24 points a game and this is a legit D that ends up living up to its on-paper potential, yes, you're a playoff team. Are you knocking the Chiefs off their what their AFC West perch? Depends on how they do in their schedule and stuff. I mean, there's a lot that goes into that. But I think this is a team that if it reaches its potential this year is playoff caliber – and then you can build on that, right? You can then start going, all right, we were in the playoffs last year. Let's set our sights on title game. All right, we made it to the title game. Let's set our sights on the Super Bowl. I can remember what it was like in the 80s when John Elway as a young Q, you know, banging his head along the way. Finally, things come together in 86. Broncos make it all the way to the Super Bowl. And from there, you know, you're just thinking you can start talking that way. But right now, it's way out there. You know, it's in, it's in the distance. You can, you can't even really see it. You know, you got ground to cover. All you need is a, is a ticket to the dance though. And then once you're in, anything can happen from there. And the Broncos 2015 season exemplified that, but I'm right there with you. Uh, I would say if they have a defense that's comparable to that level playoff team. Yeah. But Super Bowl. Let's pump the brakes a little bit. I want to see how the offense plays because like Chad perfectly laid out, we all remember that as a quarterback crap show, but there were performances in there that we would kill for right now for the current Broncos outfit. It's playoff team. Yes. Championship. Mm, Not yet. Kiaka, what's up? Hawaii living it up in paradise. Looking forward to hopefully, I think you told us you're going to be there September 26th, week three, MHH tent. Mile High Stadium. We're looking forward to that, my friend. Appreciate the support. He says, just spreading some aloha. Miss you guys. I like having Merlot on the team. <laughs> that's the first time I've said that. Uh, that that's come out of my mouth. Uh, to have a good one-two punch. A quarterback's best friend. I dislike the salary and fumbles. Do you see a potential re restructured deal to keep him beyond 21 Melvin Gordon? I really don't. I I mean, even if he goes on to have a good season, like close to similar to last year, you signed Pookie or you drafted Pookie. If you didn't draft Pookie and maybe you drafted a guy in the fourth, fifth round type thing and it's Mike Boone, and then maybe you see a future for Gordon beyond 2021. But I have a hard time seeing it now. But you never know. Stranger things have happened. NFL, the parody is so crazy that you, it's hard to predict some of those things. I love that Merlot is catching on. I feel like when he has a bad game, I'm going to have like a wine glass, put my pinky up, say I told you so about him. Uh, But in terms of Melvin Gordon, you don't trade up in the second round for a running back if you don't think he's the future. And George Payton has gushed and gushed and gushed over Pookie Williams' potential in Denver. And I would hate for the Broncos to make the same mistake with Gordon twice. If he has a good season this year, he's in a command Top five running back money on a new deal. I hope for their sake they don't invest in him again. He's a one-year rental for this year, and then it's bye-bye, Merlo. All right. We had a few supers jump in, but I just want to say to Dave, one of our great supporters, 
He said, Chad Kelly is the last Broncos cue that had the it factor. I hope Drew finds it, but I haven't seen it yet. I agree, guys. It sounds ridiculous, but for all that Chad Kelly lacks, all right, the one thing he did have was an it factor. And we didn't quite get to see it, um, you know, fully take shape in Denver because of his, you know, really just ridiculous behavior on that Halloween party. But, you know, you, you go back and watch those uh, preseason games that year and he got to play. Man, he just had an energy and, an, and uh, just a juice to him that was fun. And even going back to Ole Miss and stuff, I mean, Chad Kelly did have – I mean, this dude rapped on his own rap song, Swag Kelly. He had the it factor, but the problem is, you know, he didn't have it between the ears, right? And that was his ultimate downfall. You're talking about a guy that got drunk in a Woody from Toy Story costume and got beat up with a vacuum cleaner, and he still talked about with It Factor, but Locke can't go like this or rap on the sideline amid a victory without drawing criticism. Even though, Dave, I agree with you. He just had it. I love swag. Love watching him play, and he was this close that year to taking over the starting quarterback job. We'll never know what could have been. All we can hope for is what could be with Drew Locke. Chad Kelly is like my guilty uh, pleasure. Like I had someone tell me the other day, you know, uh, uh, my guilty pleasure is uh, when it comes to music is Lincoln Park. I think Lincoln Park's great, but this me guy's too. like, you know, my, that's my guilty pleasure is Lincoln Park. It's like whatever. When it comes to music, I don't have a guilty pleasure. If I like it, I like it. But if if there's that for football, Chad Kelly's my my. Uh, you know, I'm a little. I, I try and protect that a little bit. I'm I'm still disappointed he didn't work out. And you know what's so maddening about Kelly, man. He was this close to getting his shot. Yeah. They were they were getting ready to get off the Ke- the Keenum train. It wasn't working out. Keenum wasn't like terrible, but he didn't live up to his billing. Uh, Sean, what's up? Good to see you, buddy. All right, uh, John says you can always turn off the chat. I love how Chad and Zach handle the haters. Can't block people that disagree with you as long as they're not rude in the comments. Yeah, and we tried. We avoid like our last resort is muting let alone blocking anybody in the chat. Even people that come at us with some vitriol and stuff. It's not until it becomes troll level, uh, profanity, you know, anything remotely approaching that stuff, then we have to we have to 86 him. But Brian, what's up again, bro? Appreciate you. You don't ever have to go mahaha. I don't know what that means. Oh. The uh Oh, okay. I think that's what he's talking about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> I see John. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Good point, BG. Good, Thank you. Good, good impression, Bon Beast. Uh, Dale again. Thanks, brother. If Locke put up Herbert numbers, including wins and losses, would fans still want him gone? <laughs> good good question, dude. Good question. I'll, fans, you're going to have to answer that yourselves because what if Drew Locke came in last year and put up you know record-breaking caliber numbers but still won four games or five games or six games or whatever, and you missed the playoffs by a mile? That's a good question. They'll say he should have won seven games. You know, he, he shouldn't have, he should have lost less games. I mean, there's, there's always going to be an excuse or a rationalization to insult Locke from that sect of the fan base, always, regardless. All right, we got a rapid fire because we're seven minutes over, guys. So hold on to your supers from here because we got a dip. We don't want to let leave anyone out in the cold. Naj again. Wow, thanks, brother. Appreciate you. And Naj, if you can make it September 26th to the stadium, we want to see it. We'd love to shake your hand. He, get, he says, I get the frustration with Locke, but the coaching, especially last year, as well as key drops, didn't help Locke and cost the team at least two games. I don't think Locke can reach his potential unless he takes chances. Yeah, it's a concern of ours too, brother. And to this day, I mean, even if he goes on to succeed, I'm always going to wonder what could have been if you don't fire Rich Scangarello after 2019. And Scangarello wasn't like, you know, if you look at the offense, how it performed from a macro perspective in 2019, Scangarello didn't it didn't come out in the wash. But the one thing he did really, really well as a teacher was develop the young guys, develop Drew Locke. And that went out the window seemingly when they fired him. That's exactly what he needs right now. And this is my biggest worry is what we saw in training camp or not in training camp, in OTAs uh, this this past couple of weeks was that he was checking down or the coaching staff, you know, he's trying to keep up with Teddy Bridgewater. He needs to take chances. He needs to have that gunslinger mentality. My biggest worry, though, is Pat Shermer making Drew Locke into Case Keenum or Drew Locke into Teddy Bridgewater. He needs to be himself and play like himself. Uh, we got one here from Fernando. 
Appreciate you coming in, Fernando. You've been pretty active the last week or so. Keep it up, buddy. Becoming a superstar. Will Pat Shermer lose his job before Fangio? Zach, Fangio strikes me as a guy that's going to go down with the ship in terms of like, you know, he did fire Skangs. So, again, stranger things. But, like, at this point, it seems like these are his guys. And if he goes down, he's going to go down swinging with them on staff. Yeah, I feel like Pat Shermer is his boy, and uh, if he were to scapegoat anyone midseason, I think it'd be Tom McMahon before Shermer. So yeah, I think till the end of the year, Shermer and Fangio, unless it's just like they're 0-8 and, and the offense can't score a point, then maybe, but I don't think so. Shout out to Michael. Good to see you, buddy. Love your profile pick. Rocking the swag like a boss. You the man. Uh, Michaela, here she is. We're looking forward to having her in on the show very, very soon. Good to see you. Thank you for the support. She says, sorry, I'm late. Much love. Right back at you. Thank you. Um, All right. I think we are caught up, John. Let me double check here. Oh, nope. Dave from Georgia. Legendary. Love you, buddy. Another great pod. Thanks, brother. Hashtag state of being. Yeah, guys, have a great start to your week as we dip on out of here. We're off tomorrow, of course, for um, Tuesday, building the Broncos. And then in the morning, of course, you've got Broncos for breakfast. So don't miss that great drive time conversation with Nick Kendall, Scott Kennedy, but we're out of here and we're going to take our day off and uh, you know, circle back Wednesday, but things are happening gang. Mini camp starts tomorrow, the 15th. It runs Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, the uh, PR department forward us all the information so that we can be on top of the press conferences, have Luke in there ready to go. So we'll have plenty to talk about Zach when we come back Wednesday uh, Stu Meat, thank you for the super thank sticker, you. bro, at the 11th hour. It's good to see you. Uh, I've missed you. With that, though, Zach, sign us on out of here, bro. Yeah, have a great rest of your night, Chad and John, everyone else, everyone else out there in the chat as well. If you haven't yet, be sure to follow the Huddle Up Pod account at Huddle Up Pod on Twitter. You can follow the Mother account at Mile High Huddle on Twitter. Follow Chad at Chad and Jensen. You can follow me at Kelberman NFL. You can follow our producer, Buana Beast, at John K M H H. If you have time, guys, please go to facebook.com slash huddle. Big blue button. Become a supporter. Exclusive content. I promise you on weekends, you don't want to miss it. Also, uh, huddleapod.com. Get your swag. Yes, Chad? No, go ahead. Sorry. Um, sorry. Go ahead. Get your swag at huddleupod.com. Get yourself a hat. Get yourself a hat that he's wearing. Anything that tickles your fancy. If you can't do that, though, we totally understand. Just do one of three things, or preferably all three. Subscribe, like, and share. It helps us out more than you know. I see John nodding in approval down below me. So, yeah, do that, guys. We appreciate you. We'll be back, though, in the saddle Wednesday night, as always, 6 o'clock Mountain, 8 o'clock Eastern. Take care. And, as always, go Broncos. Shout out to Jeremy. Black Knight. You the man.